everyone, this is Kim C, and you're listening to my One Woman Stephen King podcast, where I read the King titles in shadow and in sunlight, take copious notes, collect my thoughts, and yammer on to anyone out there listening on what I've found in the nooks and crannies chock full of amazing writing from the masterful fiction hand of Stephen King. One person who absolutely knows these nooks and crannies, these King things, is the horror fiction author on today's Constant Reader interview, Throne of Honor. My guest today is a lifelong New Yorker, educator, and academic. He is the author of five short story collections and three novels, 2009's House of Windows, 2016's The Fisherman, and he's currently at work on the third novel as I speak. Our King's subject matter expert is also the recipient of the Bram Stoker Award for his novel The Fisherman, and one of the founders of the Shirley Jackson Award, for which, at present, he currently resides on the board of directors. Mesdames et messieurs, it is with great aplomb that I allow author John Langan to take the wheel of this car and drive us past the Hudson Valley, somewhere over the rainbow, with several pit stops in Midworld as we explore the roots of his king DNA, whether or not the breathing method can ever be filmed, because I don't know, guys, and why exploring King stories overall is so important. Dear friends, Mr. John Langan spins these humdrum constant reader interview questions into pure gold, so please clear your schedule right now and settle in for an amazing hour and change of conversation with a true genius within the horror fiction genre. Not only is he the most clever in all the ways, but what a cheeky charmer. John makes the most delectable sandwich, full of king knowledge, philosophical scholarship, and all the humor. I am simply a smitten kitten for this one, and I know you're all going to love it as much as I do. Without further delay, let's begin today's Constant Reader interview with horror fiction author John Langan. everyone please help me welcome horror fiction author john langan to the program welcome john it's so wonderful to have you thank you so much kim it's such a pleasure to be here oh my goodness i'm really excited <sighs> even though this is our take two on this amazing interview but it's going to be even better we can't talk about the other night. We can't talk about what happened. We can't. Uh, it's just, it's best that we just put that behind us. You're right. That was what the police recommended. You're right, John. I, I shouldn't speak of such things. I'm just, I'm just saying with time, the scars, literal and metaphorical will heal. <laughs> they do indeed. I'll get back most of the use of my left hand. So the neurologist said. Wonderful. Well, in that case, my conscience is clear. Huzzah. I'm not saying it should be clear, Kim. I'm just saying we have to move on, okay? <laughs> That's true. That's true. Wise advice. Sage advice. Okay. <laughs> All right. First question for the constant reader in my constant reader throne today is, how old were you when you read your first Stephen King story, and which title was it? You know, it's it's funny. I had actually forgotten about this. I tend to, my, my default answer tends to be uh, King's novel, Christine which I read when I was a freshman in high school and which had this transformative effect on me. And because of that, because that's my default answer, I tend to forget first that I had read Cujo the summer between eighth and ninth grade, been somewhat underwhelmed. But before that, it must have been in seventh grade, we used to get a, a little uh, paper magazine, which was put out by Scholastic, I think. It came maybe once a month. We got it in English, a reading class, actually, because we had separate reading and English classes. So it came in reading class and it had a couple of stories. It had a little, you know, historical article. It had a crossword puzzle. And it must have been, I presume, the Halloween, the October issue had a Stephen King story in it. I think probably highly edited, at least in terms of language and in, in terms of taking the R language and making it PG at worst. But it was King's story battleground which is about a hitman who has just assassinated, uh, pulled a hit on a, uh, a toy maker. And when he returns to his apartment, there's a box from the toy maker addressed to him. And he opens it, and it's full of toy soldiers. 
and the toy soldiers all in essence come alive and kill him and i i remember just yeah it's it's an amazing <laughs> amazing story and what's even crazier is to think that like you know seventh grade <laughs> <laughs> the seventh grade. I was in Catholic school too. Seventh grade Catholic school reading, you know, they're like, oh, let's read this story. And, you know, the funny thing is that I presented as like, oh, this outrageous thing. But in a way, I think maybe it was actually a pretty good thing. And, you know, maybe, maybe it was not so bad. Okay. Clean up the language a little bit if you're worried about what the parents are going to say. But other than that, let kids be exposed to this. So yeah, that kind of lurks in the, in the back of my, uh, my Stephen King DNA. And when I was a freshman in high school, after I read Christine and I decided this was it, I had to, I had to be a horror writer now. I, uh, I entered the, uh, the school Christmas writing contest and I had tried, uh, I, I was fortunate in that I've never been good with deadlines and I put this off till like the last minute, but I got sick. And so I had a day to, to work on this. And I tried writing very traditional, you know, sort of Christmas stories and none of them worked. And I got really frustrated and I thought, I'm just going to write, you know, like a Stephen King story. And so I wrote a story about a kid who makes his toys sort of psychically makes his toys come alive and kill his father. So when I think about it, um, yeah, my dad did not like that story, <laughs> but uh, my parents had had a big fight on uh, Christmas the year before. My father had had a heart attack. He was in a horrible way. He had to give up cigarettes and they, everything just came boiling out. And so a year later, I sit down and I write this story about this kid whose parents have this big fight and the mom runs out and the dad makes his toy. And, uh, and the funny thing is I never saw the connection between those two things. I never, and, and I was like, oh, you know, and my father gave me this long lecture in the car about this isn't the kind of stuff I want to see you writing. And, and at the time I was just crushed because I, I was like, you know, I won first prize. That's the $12 and 50 cents and publication in the school newspaper. That was the real prize. But my dad was just really freaked out by it. And I felt at the time like, man, you can't let me have anything. But many, many years later, somebody said to me, wow, you never got over that fight with your parents. huh?" And, and I swear to God, it was like 10 years later, it had never once occurred to me, like what seems painfully obvious now, the straight line between, you know, the event and the story. And once I realized that, I thought, oh, man, well, no wonder my dad was, you know, there may have been as much guilt motivating him as uh, just being a little freaked out. So, yeah, Battleground was the first. But I think Christine Christine was the first that connected with me on a, on a real kind of emotional level. Even though I recognize, you know, it's, it's set in a, an American high school, right, in Pittsburgh, I think. And one of the things I've said is that I, I recognize that even at the time that I was reading the book, I recognized that things were kind of exaggerated in it, that I was definitely closer to the sort of Arnie Cunningham end of the spectrum. And there were kids, you know, who bullied me or, but at the same time, those bullies, none of them were carrying switchblades and stabbing my yogurt. And, <laughs> and I was not quite as hopeless as, as Arnie was, you know? So, but I, I think part of it was that the high school stuff felt emotionally true. It may have been exaggerated, but it, it felt as if it was getting to the heart of of how I felt about things, even if, you know, the, the subconscious or whatever. And, and I think the other thing for me was, you know, I had grown up on comic books and the Lord of the Rings and Conan and all this sort of stuff. But those stories, you know, the, those narratives, the fantastic elements always like took place someplace else, you know, either Middle Earth or the Hyborian Age, or even in comic books, everything took place in New York City, you know, and I was living in, in the Mid-Hudson Valley. So King, by putting all this sort of weird supernatural stuff in a high school, even a high school in Pittsburgh, it still, again, felt like something that was really exciting. It was here we have all this crazy magical kind of stuff, even if it's mostly bad magic. And it's happening in an environment that I could have, you know, approximately recognize. That was incredible, John. Speaking of Christmas, I felt like you channeled Dickens and we went all the way back. You took me to Christmas past and I was right there for it all. Well, you're welcome. I'm sorry that was not a good Christmas. <laughs> there were there were other better Christmases, but that was not one of them. Correct, but it was a defining Christmas. It was. You know, I have never been for myself, comfortable on Christmas since then. When my kids were growing up, then things started to change, but that was because it was for them. You know, it was 
the concern was just, are they going to have a good Christmas? Oh, they have a good Christmas. Excellent. But for myself, I still feel a little bit like almost as if I'm tempting fate if I'm too happy on Christmas for myself. You know, it's like, okay, just tamp it down, tamp it down. It's fine. Just one day of the year, you're going to get through it. Dang. I, that is so rich for me, mostly because tiny tangent here. My dream job, Mr. Langan, is to be an elf at the North Pole. Dream job. Like, I am a Christmas nut. Mm -hmm. But I have had some not so great Christmases with lots of fights and sadness and tears. And so I really understand the heaviness that a lot of people feel on Christmas. And if I finally get around to composing my own fiction, which will happen someday, it's actually going to be like a darker Christmas tale because it's so loaded. It's so layered. And the fact that one Christmas can almost define a person's life, that's nuts. I love it. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it is because I, I can remember if you were to ask me, you know, I can certainly think of other Christmases that were better Christmases. But man, that one, especially in this context, I suppose. But here's the thing. I haven't written stories about any of those other Christmases. I probably should, right? You know, but none of them leapt to my mind as readily as uh, as that did. And and having written that Christmas story, I'm almost reluctant to do it again, you know, to, unless I could come up with something really different. <sighs> this is such good stuff. I want to stay here, but we, we shall move on. Maybe we'll circle back. My second question is in regards to the amount of King titles you have digested thus far on your journey, are you a constant reader who's kind of hopscotched around or have you read them all? I've read just about all of them. I'm behind on a couple of the latest books, Fairy Tale and Holly. These days, I tend to do audiobooks. I have the, the job I work at is about an hour away. And so I can pop on a Stephen King book and that, that'll that take me a good couple of weeks to get through. And, and so I'm on the highway and, you know, I'm listening to Bill Hodges or the guy in the Love in 2263. And that's, uh, that's a lot of fun. King's works, I feel, do, they read very well. They read out loud very well. And, you know, it helps to have a good narrator. But yeah, I at this point I would say I've gotten through just about all of his uh, all of his work. And if there's anything, maybe some of the film stuff I haven't gotten through. Do you know I've never seen Maximum Overdrive, uh, which I feel is is a sin against the cinema gods. But other than that, yeah, I've I've, I've managed to to make my way through his stuff. You know, the bulk of his stuff. I'm with you. I haven't seen it either. So we'll be cool kids together on the bleachers. We haven't seen it. I intend to. I just heard that he was coked out the whole time. Yes, I've heard the same thing. But is that like, is that just bad? Or is that like so bad it's good? Do you know, or are we all just going to be like, oh, yeah, I, uh, it's in a way I feel, to be honest, it's just as well that it didn't succeed because a lot of writers have just disappeared into Hollywood. And, you know, I, I think about, it's funny, Jillian Flynn, I guess now, right, is, She's promoting a series of books. Like she has her own kind of imprint at one of the big presses. So she's promoting stories of suspense. I think principally by women. I'm not a hundred percent sure. And she's done work in movies and such, but I kind of wish she would write another novel. You know, like I enjoy her novels so much and she has to do. And I'm sure don't get me wrong. Like, like I'm sure she's putting food on the table for her family, but the, the reader, the constant reader in me, right, wants to see another novel. And, and so. I'm kind of glad that King didn't get sucked into Hollywood too much and just disappear into endless development meetings for this product and that product. This project, I should say, project, product, it's all kind of the same in, in Hollywood speak. So well said. You're absolutely correct. I mean, his gift of giving us these almost two books a year now for many years now, it's like a magical waterfall of sorts. No, I'm with you. I am a huge Jillian Flynn fan. And I remember when I was making my way through her stuff, I was in grad school at the time and all the girls in my grad program, we would read her together in our little like afternoon hodgepodge book club in between teaching our classes. And we would just all of us say, this lady is a boss bitch with all respect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. This is an absolute queen who writes with razor blades that's what i think of when i think of jillian flynn yeah. razor blade author cheers that king is not swallowed by hollywood as well yeah as a constant reader who has made your way through 
basically the lot. Do you have any novels that you really, really enjoy? You really, really like these stories, but you've noticed they're not as popular or they don't get as much love from readers and then vice versa. What is one that you just don't get it? You don't get the hype, but everybody's obsessed with it. Well, I, I would answer the, the second part first. You know, I respect the accomplishment of it tremendously, but it's never quite landed for me in the same way that it seems to have for everyone else around me. Everyone, all the other writers of my generation I know all point to it and they're like, that's the book. And there are amazing things in it, but for whatever reason, whether it was overwhelming, like it was just sort of too much to take in, I, I don't know. And I, I would like to go back. I mean, I have that as another audiobook thing that I want to get back to at some point and just because it's been years and years and years. And I'd like to just sort of take another spin through it and see see how it feels. So that I, I guess that would be my my most glaring uh everybody likes this, but I don't. I and it's not even that I don't like it. It's just it's not it doesn't occupy the same position for me it does for other people. I have this this weird fondness for Dreamcatcher which seems to be like universally agreed upon, you know, it was like the worst of Stephen King's books. But uh, I guess because I read that book as in some ways, it's a kind of cathartic expression of what he went through after his accident. I sort of see all of it as working that out. I would never exactly claim it's a great novel, but I would also not, I don't think it's as bad as everybody thinks it is. The books I tend to like um, I tend to really gravitate towards are, are things like Pet Cemetery and uh, and Revival, you know, the the really, really bleak ones, but also the ones where King just, you know, he just does not take it back. He just goes, he goes, he puts the pedal to the metal and he goes just all the way. I also like Desperation. I just think Desperation's a lot of fun. It's a kind of cheesy adventure kind of thing, but I, I enjoy it. That seems to to get a lot of, maybe not hate exactly, disparagement. And I, I don't really understand why, because it, it seems to me that it's a it's a lot of fun. So yeah, I and you know it's funny. I was thinking that that Lizzie story I really I think is actually really really cool, and it's it's a book I would really like to get back to again because I feel like there's I don't I don't know if people don't like it. It just feels as if it's not in the the conversation about Stephen King as much as other things star. And I I would would like to get back to it and have another look at it. I love that. I'm so glad you mentioned Lucy's story. That's definitely a, I wouldn't say favorite, but it's one that I highly regard and I really like it. But it took me several times reading it to fall in love with it. Yeah. I think I love it because it's hard. Yeah. I think a lot of King fans are used to, one of my old roommates used to say that when she would open a King novel, she felt like she was really hungry and she was sitting down to a very good meal. Yeah. And so this is like a very strange, almost like 30 course sushi night. Right, right. I don't have the context for this. Yeah, yeah. Right. What is this? The thing about it is that the way that it's put together is so fascinating, you know, because it begins with the author already being dead and with his wife dealing with the aftermath of things. And it's Man, it's it's her realizing how little she knew about certain parts of his life anyway. And that, you know, when she's facing her own, there's the stalker, the sort of male equivalent of misery or something like that, you know. But then at the end, there's that just kind of remarkable stuff that happens at the end that, that just is, yeah, kind of mind-blowing in a, in a lot of ways. I, I think it doesn't get the recognition. I think it probably should. I didn't watch the Apple series. I guess that was good too, but I haven't I haven't seen that. Oh, well, you're in for a treat. It is really well done and it's definitely for people who read the novel. Okay. I'm absolutely dead set on that. I think everyone who either slogged or enjoyed their time with Lisey's story, they're very rewarded by the series. It's very rich and beautiful. Okay. You'll really enjoy it when you get there, but I'm so glad you mentioned Lisey because everybody who asks about Lisey, who's not an extreme constant reader, who doesn't have as many King books under their belt, I'm always like, you know, this is King Capstone. Okay. This is thesis level. Right. Right. This is going to be more challenging work. If you like that and you want a puzzly kind of experience, you'll really have fun. But if you're expecting chicken tenders and fries, right, don't. Right, right. <laughs> don't enter here. 
in a way it's this is i don't know me just sort of like making stuff up but like it's it is like this kind of weird counterpart to misery in that you know in in misery you have the writer encountering his muse who is not fun at all you know is is just there to make sure that you write the uh the cockadoody book and to do what you are capable of doing and it, it seems to me that Lizzie's story in some way takes that same idea but from the other side how the spouse or the partner of the artist is going to encounter and perceive that world and what that world is like and and the way in which the the world of the writer's creativity is this kind of scary dangerous place i mean i guess i guess you could make the argument that you know like king on some level is is also reflecting on his own struggles with addiction and such in the past but i think it may also be about his most fundamental addiction which is to writing which is what you want in a writer right but king has has frequently over the decades you know talked about writers as weirdos you know i mean not quite that phrase but a lot of the language that he's used to describe it has been sort of equivocal language and i think it's because on some level he's kind of aware that to be a writer you may be you're at some kind of weird remove from those you love and that you know he's told that story about the desk that he had he had that big desk in the middle of his office and he bought it when he became successful and he just sat behind it for a decade i think he said or the better part of a decade just wrecked out of his mind and then eventually he realized no i'll get a smaller desk it goes in the corner and he sort of turned that space into space for his family but i think that those concerns those anxieties are on, on some level still at work in in Lisi, i think good stuff there i'm going to chew on that there's a lot of meat on them bones john oh okay all right well <laughs> Thinking about Lisi, where we've got a really heinous villain in there by the name of Jim Dooley, and then we've got the cocky duty mistress of doom herself, Miss Annie Wilkes. <laughs> Let's segue to villains. Do you have any favorite Stephen King villains, and why are they your favorites? Well, I feel like I've got to say Randall Flagg, or he'll show up behind me, but <laughs> this little smiley face button or whatever. But <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, he was just... I think in terms of out and out villains, he was, I'm trying to think about that, like, like the early King novels and such. And I feel like he was the guy, you know, like, like Barlow in Salem's Lot is fearsome, but he's not on stage for a huge amount of time, you know, quite deliberately so. And he, uh, he suggests some interesting things about the vampire, but he's just, he's there to be confronted in a, in a way in the cellar, I think it is. Whereas, Flag is the walking dude. You know, he gets around and there's King sort of plays his own riff on uh, sympathy for the devil, you know, and, and, and Flag has been every place something bad has happened. Flag has been there. He's talked to this person. He's talked to that person, you know, so that the stand is in some ways kind of his apotheosis. But at the same time, he's been building up to that. He's been suggesting to this person, hey, why don't you take a gun and go here and do this? Why don't you kidnap this person? And so that kind of figure is really, I, I think, quite compelling. And he's, you know, he brings him back in Eyes of the Dragon as the sorcerer and, and such, you know. It, so, yeah, I, I think Flag is, is probably my favorite. I feel like I should say Pennywise. And I think Pennywise is maybe King's great, like, monster creation. That may be his great, like, addition to the, the canon of monsters. But, um, but I think Flag still wins out for me. Me too. Huge flag groupie, which is a terrible phrase now that I've said it. But <laughs> Yeah, I, I might revise that. Yeah, Right. <laughs> Respectful admirer. Yeah, We might redact that. Right, exactly. This, this moment where everyone's like, what? What? Because, what? yeah, you, you really don't want to be friends with flag. I don't. It doesn't end well for anybody involved. I agree. I do enjoy every time he shows up. Okay, my next question is... In regards to the reread experience, have you reread very many Stephen King titles and which one receives the most rereads? What is that secondary or tertiary or quaternary? What are those additional reading experiences like? Oh, yeah, I've um, I've gone through, man, I at different points in my life, I suppose, I've gone through different books. You know, I read and reread The Stand in the buildup to whatever day it was supposed to start, June 5th, 1986 or something like that. You know, and I remember, remember I had like a cold on that day and I was like, oh no, it's happening. It did not. But um, <laughs> there were books 
And I, I suppose I tend to like like fixate on a certain book, The Stand or The Dead Zone. I've read and reread and taught Pet Cemetery. I don't know how many times. That may be the one that I've the novel that I've reread the most. The Shining, I've reread a couple of times. I taught that recently. And I find the the rereads are really I don't know that I find them really rewarding. You know, I, I think that there are some books that you reread and you think, well, I'm kind of sorry I did that. Um, it didn't stand up to the second time through. These are, yeah, they're meals, you know, they're, they're big meals and they keep feeding you. And same thing with Cujo. You know, the first time I read Cujo, I was like, ah, well, all right, whatever. And then the next couple of times I read it, I thought, this is just, this is so bleak. I, uh, I kind of love it. So yeah, I, I would say that the more recent, I've reread more of the more recent short stories, novellas, the, uh, the recent novels I haven't, you know, like Dreamcatcher or whatever say, I think I've only read that once. So it's been a little while since I've reread one of the more recent novels. I gotcha. The dark half is, I mean, I guess that's not really recent, but I, I mean, I've, I've read and reread that a, a couple of times as well. Those. You know, there's that point where King is just, he just can't stop. He, he's always written about writers, but there's that point where he just can't stop writing about them, you know, and in this really obsessive kind of way. And I, uh, yeah, that's, so that one I've, I've gone back to a few times as, as well. Very nice. I haven't yet cracked into Dark Half. I'm going to get there. It's on the list. And the, the film adaptation of that, George Romero's film adaptation is, is really worth a look. You know, Romero has worked with King a few times, and, and I think that might be... I mean, Creepshow, a, that's a lot of fun. How can you not like Creepshow? But Dark Hat is pretty darn good. Okay, all right. I have a list of all the ones I need to tackle for the year, and so every now and again, one will get bumped. There will be a quiz, so... Good to know. I'll, I'll try and be ready. Right. A week from now, you'll be like, well, why is he on my computer? And I'll be like, all right, take out your blue booklets. Oh my gosh. Put away your cell phones. I love school. I'm going to be like, Mr. Langan, I'm going to fail, but I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to talk about characters for a little bit. Protagonists, antagonists. Is there anybody in the King universe who, like Danny Torrance from The Shining, who got his own standout sequel with Dr. Sleep? Is there anyone who you would like to have their own standout novel? Like Holly got this last year. And do you have anybody who you would like more from? You know, it, it's funny. I mean, like I think to myself, not exactly, because a lot of the narratives feel so complete. It feels as if, like say in the case of the Losers Club, right? It feels as if to demand a sequel for them where it comes back is almost unfair. You know, and granted, that can be how life is. Life is life is not necessarily fair. But within the realm of fiction, it, it feels deeply unfair for all of them to have given so much and to have sacrificed so much, lost so much, braved so much in confronting Pennywise, for Pennywise just to pop up again and be like, here I am, boys and girls. Like, that feels like, come on, that's that's not right. Although, having said that, you know, in Dreamcatcher, for example, I don't know why I'm fixated on that book today, <laughs> um, there's the statue of the losers on which graffiti has been, you know, Pennywise lives has been written. And, and so... That does suggest that there might be some room for a further Pennywise story, but I would hope that the losers would be left alone for the time being. I mean, I think there were more, it's almost like there were more sort of places I'm kind of curious about or, or myths I'm kind of curious about. You know, the, the whole mythology that King constructs in Duma Key, and which to the best of my knowledge is just a one-off, it's just for that book. It feels as if there's something more there and, and as if that that might be the kind of thing that a further novel or novella or whatever might explore, not necessarily with Edgar, but with somebody else going to find out more about that. So I, I feel like most of his characters, by the time you get to the end of the book, you feel like, man, he's put you through the ringer. You deserve you deserve to just, for things to be quiet for you for the, the remainder of your life, not to have any of these things. Because otherwise it, it becomes... I mean, there's the risk, right, of there's an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer where Giles calls them all together and he says, oh, you know, it's the, we're facing the apocalypse. And they all say, again? <laughs> and, and I think that that's the danger, right, is that he could make it work for Danny Torrance because Danny is so young in The Shining. He could take him forward in time decades and 
you know, have him repress those memories and so on. So that kind of, he could make that work. There's the question, right, of uh, of Charlie McGee, what happens to her at the end of Firestarter, right? You know, she's going into uh, to Rolling Stone, right? All the news that fits. I mean, I think... I think that King, to the extent that he's he's like a kind of 60s optimist, wants us to believe that Rolling Stone, this great, great, you know, magazine of the counterculture is going to publish the the expose and it's going to bring the shop down. And, all, and, and that's possible, certainly. But it's just as likely that this little girl, you know, comes in and, and they're just like, hey, sweetie, no, you know, and she goes off and lives her life quietly. So I, I guess what I mean is, is that you could maybe imagine a, a Charlie McGee story where she has grown up and is now in her 50s, say, and still has these abilities, but she's never really done anything with them. And then something happens to her. That could be that there could be sort of interesting plot happening there. Also, I mean, I guess the other exception I would make to this is that, you know, King and Straub, King and Peter Straub were supposed to be writing a third novel in their Jack Sawyer sequence. And supposedly they had talked about it before Peter died. So I would be, I'm, I'm quite curious to see what the, what that would look like, you know, if, if, if King ever gets around to that. Oh, such amazing answers, John. Oh my gosh. So good. That's actually a question that I think I might put on my list here in regards to Charlie. If someone knocked on your door, very much Robert Langdon style, and said, you have to write the next Charlie McGee novel, show pilot. I would say I'd like to see the check and then you know, I'm yours. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to go cash this and then we'll <laughs> Also, I need to know that it's okay with Stephen King because that's just, that's not going to work out so well otherwise. Absolutely. Very, very smart. Because yeah, I love that answer that what if she just lived a quiet life and then in her 50s discovered all that fire all over again. Yeah. We are going to talk about... Yeah, we'll do this question. This one's a fun one. So this is a very open, raw reaction question. But before I ask it, I'm only knocking at the door of Wolves of the Cala. So I have Mm -hmm. not finished the series. So this question is asking, what are your thoughts about the Dark Tower? No, I think it's, it's remarkable. I remember when I first started reading King, it had only been published, The Dark Tower, in the limited edition by Donald Grant Press, I think it was, with the lovely illustrations by Michael Whalen. And, and it was just fascinating. And, and I, I remember reading, I think it was Doug Winter's book, Stephen King, The Art of Darkness, where he talks about it there. So like, I read about it before I read it, and I was like, this just sounds crazy. This, Yeah, it, it just sounded so fascinating to me and, and just, yeah, just so weird. So I finally, it was finally published in paperback, I want to say when I was like a senior in high school. So I, I got it right away. And I kind of loved it. I loved how murderous Roland was in, in that first book. And I know that in, in the rewrite, King has kind of sanded the edges off that a little bit. But I always kind of liked that Roland was a little bit scary and, and that you weren't sure that he was playing with a full deck, you know, that, that there was, <laughs> there was the revolver was not necessarily, every chamber was not loaded. And there was this, yeah. And, and I think just the kind of like, the weirdness of it. Like, what is he doing? You know, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed, you know, what a great opening line, but what is the, why is he chasing this guy? Who is this guy? Is this guy Randall Flagg, right? Old Walter O'Dim. And so I love the way that he kept having these adventures in this weird world that seemed sort of post-apocalyptic, but also sort of not, or, or even as if a world in which you were moving through different patches of time within the landscape, um, which I guess he kind of plays at with the notion of the thinny, but even more profoundly than that. And I think in general, too, that sense of a world and, you know, the world has moved on. Our best days are behind us. You know, that's such a fundamentally, I want to say, American obsession at the moment. Maybe it's always been an obsession. I mean, maybe we've always felt like, yeah, the golden ages in the past. But yeah, what he does with those novels, you know, sort of assembling them first as, in a lot of cases, the, the first few books as novellas and short stories here and there that he then kind of stitches together. And the, the scope of the thing, the, the way that you realize things are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you go. I would like him to take maybe another look at, at book six and seven. There's maybe some things. I, I mean, I get that I get that he wrote those after the accident when he was like, I just got to get this done. You know, in case anything happens, I have to know that I, I got to the end of the thing. 
fair enough. But I, I think there are a few kind of rough spots that that maybe would not be so bad to be for him to sort of iron out a bit. But and the artists, I, when I was a kid, I loved to draw. I wanted to be a comic book artist. That was like my first passion. So to see so many great artists working in in each of these books is is also a treat. Is is also just a, a really really cool thing to see. And I love the thought that he he kind of creates it as this. Um, you know, it's funny the the image of the tower, right? Is the enormous black tower. And there are these beams that radiate out from it, and they kind of hold all of creation together. And there's there's some way in which I, I think that the Dark Tower series functions that way for King's work. You know, it's supposed to be this monolith that sort of holds everything together, or at least a lot of stuff together. There are play gaps, and there are places where things just occur wherever. But I, uh, yeah, I, I think the ambition that he shows there is just kind of amazing. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know anybody else who's done anything quite quite like that, unless you want to go back to Faulkner or Balzac or something like that. You know, these people who are trying to create these entire fictional universes. Oh, well said. I want to clap after that one, John. That was super good. <laughs> well, thank you. This next question is in regards to chatting to non-King folk. I think the majority of us don't speak to a lot of them. But when we do, what do you recommend to the people who think he's pulpy, trash, or too scary? It's weird. You know, I think it depends. Somebody who is just dismissive, I'll just say, okay, that's fine. You know, like, like I, don't, I, I don't necessarily need to convince you, you know? If it's when I used to teach, I teach high school now. Uh, when I used to teach college, I taught a few times a class called Stephen King Goes to the Movies, and it was about film adaptations of King's works. So, you know, sometimes you have to really sort of the students who are apprehensive in various ways, and I, you just have to say, look, trust me, you know, like, the college is not going to let me do this if they think I'm going to, you know, mess you up. But um, but I would also, for those students, I, I would try to allow them to keep that question alive. Yes, I'm making you read The Body, and then we're going to watch Stand By Me. What do you think? Do you think this succeeds? Do you think it doesn't succeed? That's fine. You know, it's fine, but you have to explain to me your reasoning, your aesthetic criteria, and so on for not liking this. So that way, my hope, I suppose, was that they would at least understand, they would get something out of it by understanding their own standards of, of judgment. But I think for somebody who seems interested, but is like, I don't know where to start, you know, what do I do? I would probably start them with some of the novellas. I think Different Seasons is a great place to start. Obviously, The Body, Stand By Me. And and there's enough variety in there, the Shawshank Redemption, Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption, the novella, and the scary story, the breathing method at the end, but of, of a kind of uh, club story format that I think people are familiar with and people can say, oh, okay, that's all right then. So yeah, I think I would probably start with the novellas. I think King works often better at length, but I also think plopping it into someone's lap and saying, there you go, that's all you need or the stand, I think that would maybe be a bit under the dome, you know, I think those things would be a bit too much. Let them work up to those if that's what they want. I love that so much. I was actually chatting with somebody recently about the breathing method, and I do have a tiny follow-up question because I'd love to know your thoughts. Do you think it can ever be adapted to film based on the ending, John? That is a, that's a really interesting question because... There are films that have graphic scenes in them, but those graphic scenes, I, I think, tend to be either they're supposed to be really funny or they're supposed to be really horrifying. The end of Hannibal, the film, and also the book for that matter, right, is really supposed to be over the top, and it is over the top, and it is horrifying and such. Whereas the end of the breathing method is horrifying, but King is like, he's trying to like get the needle, you know, the, the thread right through the eye of the needle and say, you know, what will a mother do for her child? And that, I, I don't know. I don't know if you could, I mean, a great filmmaker could do anything, I, I suppose. But yeah, that would be a tricky one. That would be a tricky one to get right. I agree. I, I just don't know how. <laughs> I love the Manhattan Club so much. I really would love more stories that are derived from that yeah me too me too so great right but the breathing method it's such a oh I'm, i just shake my head i'm like i don't know i don't know how you do it without having protesters outside the theater or something right right 
Okay. This question, we're going to start with some of the fun ones. I would like to know about your favorite Stephen King couple, friendship, team, romance, duo. Who are your your favorites when they're more than one? Well, it's funny. I mean, in some ways, I think about Lewis and Judd in Pet Cemetery, and and I think about the the beginning of, of Pet Cemetery, where King says, "Oh, you know, it was when he was whatever age, Lewis met the man who should have been his father." And there's there's something, and I and I kind of it's funny. I kind of love Fred Gwynn in that role in the in the film. I'm not sure how much the rest of like the rest of the film is a little wobbly to me, but Fred Gwynn really inhabits that role in a way that I really like. I think Edgar and Wireman in Duma Key. And, you know, of course, the Losers Club, I mean, you have to, you really have to to give a shout out to them, right? I mean, so much of King's work is about, you know, sort of finding friendship and, and sometimes even to the extent of finding family, finding these people that, you know, back in Salem's Lot, you, you have to put together the group of fearless vampire hunters. And they even kind of know that they're following the template of Dracula when they talk about one of the characters the doctor maybe or no it's somebody else and they say who does he remind you of oh van helsing so it's often it's uh, it's quite self-conscious but you know the the characters in the stand who go out to las vegas to make their stand and I, and i think in in a lot of ways i still think that ending is it's just kind of remarkable especially especially today or, or or in today's kind of entertainment culture and entertainment landscape because they're going out there to be sacrificed they're going out there to die they're, they're going to make a stand but they're not going to make a stand the way Roland would with his gun. They're going to make a stand just with themselves. And and that is, is I don't think King gets enough credit for that, for how kind of remarkable that is, that the, the climactic act is just these guys. I mean, I guess to a certain extent, there are distractions so that the trash can man can bring the A-bomb, get it into the, the middle of Las Vegas. And quite often, too, those characters, you know, one of the things that you notice a, a lot of King's characters do, not all, but a lot of them, is uh, is say, I love you. As you go, even Roland at the end is able to say, I love you. And and that's a big, a big move for him, you know, from, from sorry, I just gave away something from one. Anyway, I uh, forget I said that if you haven't read that novel yet. No worries. No worries. That's, that's something to look forward to, John. I celebrate that. So I think that you could do you could do this kind of interesting study of how King deals with the forming of relationships, the forging of certain bonds between his characters and among his characters, and how quite often the characters who are like, say, the the losers are able to form that bond with each other. They rely on each other. They depend on each other. And because of that, they're able to defeat it. The way that it operates is by separating you, by separating you and putting you alone with your own fear, whatever it is you fear the most. It presents that to you. And so I don't know if a lot of King's monsters, I feel like, operate in that sort of isolating kind of, uh, kind of way. Well, Annie, uh, in, in misery, right? I, I mean, you know, she, she's got old Paul <laughs> right where she wants him. So yeah, there's this kind of, I think, ongoing tension in King's stuff between versions of community, even if it's just you and one other person, or you and your cat, you know, um, <laughs> the good cat in the cat's eye thing, versus a monster or monstrous forces that are always trying to destroy you, that, that are always trying to isolate you and, and to destroy you. John, you're familiar with the film Wizard of Oz, yes? I am. Yes, I am. Okay. You know that part where it goes from black and white Kansas and then Dorothy opens the door, and it's Oz. Yes, and it's... yes, yes, yes. That's what you're doing with these questions, John. <laughs> you are taking taking it to Technicolor. Okay, I can, I can, I can live with that. They're so beautiful. You just must know. We're going from black and white Kansas. These dumb little ditties on my page, and then John's taking them. No, they're great questions, and I, I think the thing about King's work is that it, it rewards. It rewards questioning, you know, that there's really something to be said for doing a deep dive into individual writers and then even individual books, you know, to take something like The Shining and just say, okay, we're just going to, we're going to plunge into this and see what we can do. The books can sustain that. King's work can sustain this kind of attention. Well said, sir. Yes, that's kind of what I aimed to do with this little podcast of mine, because I didn't care who listened to it. 
I just knew I was in love with this man's writing. And there was such a passion for spending time with the text and I couldn't hold it in any longer. (laughs) And so you're really speaking my language, John. Well, good. (laughs) All right. I don't know if you are. Well, I think you might have mentioned once or twice sometime that you did have a lot of king copies archivist level potentially yeah there was a time when i was a kid you know that that anytime stephen king had a new new story in a magazine or an anthology or whatever i was out there man i was uh i was tracking it down and this was pre-internet era i couldn't get everything of course but yeah anything that showed up in a bookstore that had stephen king in it i was there and i I include magazines you know and and even things that were just kind of tangentially related there was um Red Book or one of those magazines that sort of like, you know, little digest sized magazine about New England had a Stephen King issue. And it was just, I think it was just an excuse to sell some copies. But nonetheless, I, you know, I bought that and and sort of poured over those photos, you know, and oh, that's, this is supposed to be, I, I don't even remember, but this is the possible source for Derry or the, the river and uh, the creek and, and that the kids dam up in it. And then also things that were like connected to King, whether, you know, Doug Winter's biography, or uh, there were a few collections of critical articles pretty early on. One was called Fear Itself, and I can't remember what the other one was called, but they were these little signet paperbacks, and they were a hodgepodge, you know? I mean, some of the stuff was really great and really brilliant, and some of it, not so much. Yeah, I, I would try to get my hands on uh, on whatever I could. Very nice. If you were to, out of the collection you've amassed over the years. Get one thing signed and personalized. Don't know if you have one already, but if you had the opportunity to get one thing, which title would it be? In some ways, I feel like Pet Cemetery because that's one I just keep coming back to. At the same time, Skeleton Crew, you know, that collection of stories. I mean, I love King's stories. I think he's just a brilliant, brilliant story writer. I think Skeleton Crew might be my favorite. You know, there are great stories scattered throughout all the collections um, and, and a lot of, you know, good and very good stories too. But I think, I think either of those would probably be, would probably be my first, my first choice, possibly revival if I had to pick something later, because I really love that book. But, you know, I mean, King could give me pretty much anything. <laughs> it, it wouldn't have to be like if whatever, you know, like my was it when he wrote My Pretty Pony or My Little Pony or whatever? I mean, <laughs> uh, fine. That's fine, Steve. I'll take that too. Right. He can sign my gum wrapper and I'd be happy. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Sign my retainer, Mr. King. You know, that made me think of Ralph from The Simpsons. I don't know why. Although I think Millhouse has a retainer. Millhouse right? has a retainer. There you yeah. go. <laughs> Millhouse, do you have a change purse? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Too much fun. Okay. My next question is in regards to, yeah, we're, we're going to keep it cute on this cute train. Do you have a favorite Stephen King four-legged creature? Is there someone who you just have near and dear to your heart that's an animal in the King universe? Well, I feel like if you don't say, oi, the Billy Bumbler from uh, the Dark Tower books, then you have no heart, no soul. You're dead inside. <laughs> so I have to say, oi. But, you know, I, I mean, Cujo is... He's actually sort of compelling and and in a way a kind of tragic figure in that he gets rabies. He just wants to be a good dog. He just wants to take care of his people and he gets rabies and it does what rabies does, which don't get me wrong. He's terrifying. I mean, a rabid St. Bernard is pretty frightening, but there's a a kind of pathos to him as well. And we mentioned the the cat before from Cat's Eye, the Drew Barrymore, the the short, you know, where the the cat is dealing with the uh, the little gnome or troll or whatever. That's a good cat. So I think, and any of those would be, yeah, would be a good choice. If they knocked on your door, John, and they had the check ready and said, we need you to write the next Firestarter installment, and you could magically transport to a Stephen King setting to write this, to uh, endeavor to write this Charlie installment. You could go to the Overlook for a couple months. You could go to Joyland, Castle Rock. Where would you go to get stuck for a little while? Well, I feel Castle Rock might be the safest 
most of those locations, although, <laughs> you know, I mean, the Overlook has burned to the ground. So, but God knows there's probably something new there now. Yeah, I, I think I would probably want to head to want to head to Castle Rock and, and sort of check it out. You know, the work that King has done with uh, Rich Chismar and the Gwendy's books and sort of expanding our sense of Castle Rock makes it seem uh, uh, slightly that there were slightly more benign parts of it. Part of me likes, you know, the the little island in, um, is it the Reach, I think, and and thinks it would be fun to, to be on a little island like that for a little bit of time. And, and especially if you were like, ah, I got to get this fire starter thing done. I need to be, I need to be free of distractions. Maybe that island would be the best place to be. Oh, beautiful. I'd be right there with you. There's Little Tall, which I think is Dolores Claiborne's neck of the woods. And then there's Goat Island, which is where you're referencing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. From the Reach, which, oh, I love that story so much. Yep. I'd be there with you at the cottage across the river there. You'd be like, are you done? I'd be like, no, I'm going to stop it. Stop <laughs> harassing me. Get, come on, finish. Hurry up, John. Hurry the up, meter's finish. running. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The boat is waiting. <laughs> All right, Mr. Langan. Favorite Stephen King television adaptations or films? Oh, well. Well, I, I mean, King has had, we, we already touched on this a little bit in, in talking about Romero and the dark half. You know, King has... I mean, he's been remarkably fortunate in the filmmakers that he's worked with, you know, right off the, right out of the gate with De Palma directing Carrie. And then you've got Toby Hooper doing Salem's Lot, Kubrick obviously doing The Shining. You've got uh, Cronenberg doing Dead Zone. You, uh, you wind up with Frank Darabont, with Rob Reiner. And, and I'm leaving out a ton of other, Mick Garris has done a whole bunch of stuff with King, especially the, the TV stuff. I think. I think my my favorite King adaptation, my favorite TV adaptation is probably Storm of the Century miniseries. Maybe that's cheating. I'm not sure. There was a a wonderful adaptation of King's story, Grandma, that was done on the the second incarnation of the Twilight Zone, which was pretty, uh, which was pretty darn scary. But I think, I, I think in terms of TV adaptations, it's a little easier for me to zero in on the Storm of the Century. In terms of film adaptations, there's so many good ones. I mean, I know we all know how King feels about Kubrick's Shining. And it's a different, you know, it's uh, 13 ways of looking at a blackbird. You know, it's it's just a different take on the same material. But uh, when I was a kid, we were all terrified of that movie. None of us had seen it, but we just did it such a, it was one of those films that had such a sort of aura of menace about it. And yet... And actually, and even even Carpenter's adaptation of Christine is not bad. It has some wonderful visuals in it. The car on fire chasing one of the bad guys through the night is just a wonderful, wonderful image. But yeah, there's things like the Lawnmower Man movies or Children of the Corn or whatever, but there is no writer who would turn down that money, to be frank. If somebody came along and said, look, we're going to make your, take your story, we're going to make it into a movie and blah, blah, blah. There is no writer who would say, no, not me. I'm too good for money. Um <laughs> And I, I think whatever that stuff is just, it is what it is, but things like, you know, for, for the moment, yeah, the dark half is, is sort of sticking in my mind. So I'll, uh, anybody who hasn't seen that, I would say, take a look at the, take a look at the dark half. It's, it's got some really cool stuff in it. Good to know. I will put that at the top of the list. I think, yeah, book and movie need to go hand in hand here pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They do. Okay, just a couple more. We're making our way to the end here. This next question is about the Stephen King ladies. Do you have a favorite Stephen King female? Well, I think Bev in, um, it, it's funny, isn't it? Because I said, you know, it, oh, I don't know how I feel about it. And yet I keep coming back to that book, right? <laughs> but uh, she's a, a great character. And I don't know if any of the film adaptations have gotten adult Bev quite right. You know, I, I think that that she's, as a, as a girl, she seems so obviously heroic and such. And I, I think that there's, there's more to be done with her as an, and I think King does more with her as an adult. I, I think that there's, there's more to be done there. I guess if, you know, I, I mean, you know, misery, Annie, you kind of have to, if you don't name her, she'll come after you. I think uh, I've always, always had a soft spot for Jack Sawyer's mom in the talisman, even though you don't really see her that much, but she motivates his entire quest. And there's something about her, the way that King and Stroud present her. She just seems very sort of 
Lauren Bacall esque, you know, sort of elegant, this remnant of a of a bygone age. But I think there's like the more I think about it, the more I'm like, yeah, but you know, the woman in Rose Matter, the protagonist in in that novel, does uh, you know, King does some really interesting things with her, and in the stand. Yeah, there's there's actually a, and in Lisey's story, right? Lisey, I, I think King tries in Lisey's story, say right, King is trying to expand his range as a writer. He uh, he famously said, "Oh, you know, I I think he let Nan Talese or someone edit the book sort of ruthlessly." Okay, that was part of it, but I think part of it also was really trying to push himself to inhabit a different character, a, a widow, a grieving widow, but who's also discovering these things about her husband she never knew. And discovering aspects to her husband's existence that, that, and to existence itself that she never knew. So, um, yeah, for the moment, maybe Lisi, may, maybe she gets the, uh, the, you know, gold medal. Such a great list. Oh, wow. You listed some real solid choices. So good. I was thinking about pretty much the whole time since you mentioned Lisi's story. We've got Lisi and then we have Rosie McClendon from Rose Matter. And I, I really feel those ladies are paralleling each other much more than I realized. And I was just kind of thinking about each of them in their own novels. And I'm like, wait a minute, Lisi goes into a magical world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, Rosie goes into the the space where there's the kind of like spider mother scary figure. And in both cases, the husband turns out to be, then, then in, in Rosie's case, he's hostile. In um, in Lisi's case, he's just different. He's just different than she realized, and may be part of the myth pool. May have maybe part of those ranks of the dead, the not quite dead who are at the myth pool. Sort of, I, I think those are the ancestors, as it were. Yeah, no, there's there's something that, and there's the connection with art in both cases. In uh, Rose Matter, it's the painting, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think there's there's definitely something there. Right? I just started to spin out a little bit. Of no, no, that's that's very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why I love constant reader interviews. I get all the good stuff <laughs> for my brain. It's magic. Yeah, yeah. All right. We have, I think, two more. Yeah, this next one is, it's a newer question. It's one I, I'm test driving a little bit. Do you have a character who you just hated? Like, they really made you so angry that you would insert bodily harm of your choice <laughs> <laughs> throat punch running them over who knows like you just be as creative as you want with the macabre who would you destroy <laughs> no one um <laughs> i mean here's the thing king is really good at writing frustrating like like bad evil frustrating characters you know and there's a certain kind of character of of sort of low cunning uh, or maybe I should say low intelligence, high cunning. This is what the bully in high school turned into. Um, and, he, and he writes those characters very well. And they are really kind of loathsome. And he writes hypocrites, uh, especially religious hypocrites, I think, really, really well. And they are also just loathsome and, and yeah, maddening. But I also think that those characters tend to get what's coming to them. You know, there's, as it were, they all gather in Las Vegas and then kaboom. And so I, um, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's anything I could imagine to do to them that's worse than what King does to them. I think that, you know, that what's interesting to me is King's kind of his own, what seems to be his own ambivalence towards certain characters. At the end of the stand, when Stu is thinking, ah, I think I maybe need to get out of Colorado. I need to get out of the city because there's a new guy who's been elected sheriff or chief of police or something. And he's like, like he just looks a little bit like a Puritan and he's like, I don't, and it's not that he's a bad guy necessarily, but it's just, he's, he's not the kind of, you know, he's humorless. He's not going to be the kind of guy that, that you want to have to deal with if you can avoid it. And I think that King is also good at that. At, at like, like I'm sort of fascinated at these moments in King where you're like, well, this guy is the sheriff or whatever. He's not a bad guy, but he's also, King also doesn't trust him, you know, and, and whether that's, don't trust anyone in authority or not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. In, in terms of of anybody, I, there's nobody I really want to. Nobody I really want to kill in uh, Stephen King. <laughs> I like it. I wish I were more like you, John. <laughs> well, you know, 
you get old close to death and you think to yourself, I don't want to tip the wheel of Khan any one direction. That's true. That's so yeah. smart. I should keep yeah. that in mind because, yeah, I, I don't want the wheel. <laughs> You're right. The wheel can crush you. Yeah. Correct. Uh, yeah. But I think this question was mostly inspired by my experience with Under the Dome. I read it during COVID, which was a poor choice in retrospect. And Big Jim Rennie is just causing havoc and a menace yeah. for a thousand pages. And I feel, yes, at the end, we we do get a satisfying exit from the novel. But for me, I was so, I it was like, no justice was going to suffice. I needed blood, John. <laughs> right, right. I, I um, I'm a little glad we're on Zoom right now. Yeah. I was absolutely feral and tribal, and I don't know why. I think whatever was going on in the existential dread of my reality at that time, I poured into my under the dome reading. That's the only answer I have because it was. It was frightening the amount of of rage I had in my body for Big Jim Rennie. Well, I think that I feel like King, you know, he has a story in Hearts in Atlantis where this guy is on the throughway and it stopped. He's sort of stuck in traffic and all these things just start to fall out of the sky. Motorcycles, washing machines, whatever. And they're just like sort of crushing the people beneath them and, and all this. And, and, you know, that's collection, I guess, where I, I really see King starting to like look back on his own kind of like baby boomer generation and, and thinking about the, and he said this, like, Oh, we could have changed the world. And instead, you know, we got like HBO <laughs> and, and I sometimes think he's a little, maybe too hard on himself, but I, I think I see big Jim Rennie and, and characters like that. Greg Stilson in the dead zone. They're that part of his generation. I think they're that, you know, fiddling while Rome burns and, and possibly even splashing gasoline on it. And, and it's it's hard, you know, with those two, with with Stilson and Rennie, they're not even bad guys who necessarily think they're doing the right thing exactly. They're just kind of lunatics ultimately, and and I think that that's especially frustrating that nobody can see that. Thank goodness it has no relevance whatsoever to our contemporary situation in the United States. Thank heavens we're spared, John. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank <laughs> heavens we're just reason rules in America. <laughs> God, we're in hell. <laughs> <laughs> the, well said, John. Well said. I love that. And I think, yeah, I frighten myself sometimes because I'm like, you know, some dogs just need to be put down. And that's a frightening, you know, I would never, of course, do this in real life. But in my fictional book writing life, I'm like, I can't stand this person. Death. Swiftly. Right. Swift death. Death and nothing else. But you, thank you for indulging me on that question. Not at all. Not at all. You are a better man than me. <laughs> uh, like I said, I'm just trying not to draw the attention, the ire of Ka. I'm trying not to wise. draw. It's, it's yeah, yeah. Wise, wise, wise. Okay, I think we have one more question. Actually, two. I skipped one. I'm sorry. We got two more. That's okay. Two more. All right. This one you kind of touched on a little bit, but it's still good. So I'd like to hear your thoughts. Stephen King, for whatever reason over the years, got on this strange zone of not being an author who ends the novel well. And this mm -hmm. kind of echoed around for a couple of years. And the majority of constant readers I talk to say, that's no, I don't. I disagree. It's all about the journey. Or some people say, yeah, after a thousand pages, this was pretty unsatisfying and might have ruined it for me. But what are your thoughts on Stephen King endings? You know, it's, it's funny, like I've also picked up on this over the last couple of years. I, I think, you know, there's the the cameo that King makes in uh, the second recent It movie where he says to um, the version of himself in the, in the novel, oh, I hear your endings suck. I, I have never, I've never felt that way, I suppose. You know, on the balance, I've felt that, that King's novels end really, really effectively. I, uh, I like to tell this story that I was... Um, traveling uh, interstate with my older son at one point and he was probably about like like 14 or 15 and we were on a very busy road route 287 which which is just you know high speed traffic and uh lots of cars and he asked me oh you know what about stephen king so i started to tell him the story the, the pet cemetery story just narrated the book to him and when we got to the ending where rachel's hand falls on lewis's shoulder 
I just put my hand on his knee and holy cow, he like just about went through the ceiling. And this was like broad daylight. We were, like I said, we're in a, a speeding car surrounded by other speeding cars. And yet, man, that ending landed. I was not like I, I, because I was trying to pay attention to the road, even as I was telling him this, like I wasn't doing like all sorts of woo, spooky, you know, uh, sound effects or whatever. It was just so the, I, I think that what King will do in a, a novel like The Stand, say, right, is it's a literal deus ex machina and he'll give you that and just be like, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a like there's a part of me that I, I hear it right. You you've been on the the train for a, a thousand pages, and you're like, come on, man, you know, <laughs> don't give me the hand of God. But then there's another <laughs> part of me that is is like, no, but you know that like is I want to say is daring, you know, like because it's not. Some people will be like, you know, that's an f you to the reader. I, I don't think so. I think it's more like I am not going to give you what you think you want. I'm going to try to give you something else. And the fact that people keep talking about his endings makes me think then they're not bad. Because if they were really bad, I don't know that anybody would talk about them unless they were like some kind of incredible level of badness. But but I think it's more that he frustrates your expectations and you're like, oh, you frustrated my expectations. But I, I think that's okay. I, I think that's what a, what a writer is supposed to do. Dead on. Hit the nail on the head. This is our final question. Okay. We made it. What are your top five Stephen King titles? They can be novels, novella collections, short stories. What allowed them to make your top shelf? Okay. So a lot of them would have to be story collections because uh, it lets me cheat and it lets me get in more titles. (laughs) So, you know, something like, I mean, and, and in fact, honestly, I mean, I could just say, oh, Night Shift, Skeleton Crew, Just After Sunset, Nightmares and Dreamscapes, and Full Dark No Stars, or something like that. You know, some some combination of that. And for my little home on Goat Island, those would be fine to have to read as I'm trying to write the next for, you know, the the, the continuation of, of Firestarter. <laughs> because there's so much in, in each of those books, you know, the, the, in each of the stories in those books. But also, you know, having having said that, I, I mean, King has accomplished a lot of, in the novel, um, and he's he's done a lot. I, I sometimes think that King and a few other writers like Ramsey Campbell and Peter Straub, maybe maybe Anne Rice as well, you know, they were this first generation of writers to be horror writers, to be horror novelists. And so one of the things that they did was to play around with the novel form. What can you do at, at novel length with the horror narrative? thinking about it that way then yeah like i have to go back to pet cemetery because that's it's a favorite so is revival but then i think to myself man you know like but what about it you know (laughs) what about just taking it with you and just uh, it's inescapable this this kind of big book that you can just dip into you can read the whole thing through but you can also just dip into it time and and time again and then I think, well, maybe you should include a Dark Tower book in there somewhere. And that, you know, in, there are times I think that the second, the drawing of the three is my favorite. There were other times, Wolves of the Cala is really good. I, I really, I really like that one a lot. And then, you know, there were still other times I think I should just pick something, you know, The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon or something, like sort of short offbeat book or on writing, like these sort of short offbeat books where King is just like, this girl's lost in the woods. Let's see what happens. Um, and she's being pursued by this bear monster, right? Maybe. But then I also think, ah, but what about like Dance Macabre? Because that, you know, the observations that King makes in there, the combination of autobiography and kind of film history and literary study and appraisals of his contemporaries, that's just a, a really, that's a book that's very, very close to my heart. So I... I would probably mix in a couple of short story collections. I would add a couple of novels. I'd, I'd probably do something like Pet Cemetery and It, maybe, and then maybe Dance Macabre. I think that would that's how I would try to approach the top five question. Beautiful. Nicely done. I'm so glad you mentioned the short story collections because I feel they're very underrated. The constant yeah. readers, we we do appreciate them, of course, but when it comes to listing the top five, I don't think they get a spot. Usually they're yeah. never on the shelf. The only one who might get on the shelf is different seasons. Yeah. The film adaptations, right? I mean, they've made brilliant films out of those 
out of three of those four novellas, as, as we were saying. I love that you two are a short story fan and appreciate his collections because they absolutely blow my dress up. They're my favorites. Well, you know, King writes short stories the way that he writes novels. He allows things the time to happen. And that, especially in Night Shift, you know, those those first stories, I mean, they are like little little novels, the boogeyman, or sometimes they come back. The print in my edition is really tiny. I suspect if you were to actually do a word count, you would find out that's a huge book. That's a much bigger book than any of us thinks, because so many of those stories were King just kind of like letting his imagination out to play and, and see what happened. Love it. I have a lesson in one of my classes, my workshop classes, and it's brevity. And the students hate it because they're ready to write their novels. They're ready to give me yeah. 45 pages. And I said, no, 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 no. You only get 750 words. And they flip out and they throw tantrums almost. Yeah. And that's why I love King short stories, because it's like, look at what this guy does with so few pages. That's where the brilliance is. Yeah, I think when you say, okay, you've only got a page to do this, or you've only got, you know, you can't use, I used to have a creative writing teacher who would say, yeah, you, you can't use these words. And it's, you know, the same thing as, well, if you're playing basketball, you can't kick the ball. You have to use your hands. You have to throw the ball in this particular basket. You can't throw it in your own basket. You have to bounce the ball when you run. The rules shape what you can do. And then people do amazing things within those rules. Haiku, the syllable counts, the turn and all this kind of stuff within it. I think that any kind of stricture can actually be a great source of creativity for students. You know, I, I taught a, a fiction writing, uh, an installment in a fiction writing workshop a few years ago, and it was about opening lines. And man, did it freak students out because <laughs> there's a... Uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but there's a story that the first Clarion workshops, science fiction writing workshops, Damon Knight was one of the founders, and he would take everybody's story the first night, and then he would give it back to them the next day. And what they noticed was some of the stories, like two lines down, there was a red line just going across the page. And then other people noticed that there was a red line, but it was like a page or two pages in. Other people noticed it was like halfway through. And then there was like maybe one story where there was no red line. So they were like, what is this? And he said, that's when I stopped reading. Wow. And yeah, he, he said, you know, now that he was like, you know, I'm treating this as a commercial editor. When I get your story in, in my, <laughs> in that fabled era in the mail, I'm not going to read it to the end if it loses my interest. And so if your story gets really good on page 50, then start on page 50. And so anyway, the, the assignment for my students was just write a compelling opening. And holy cow, did they freak out about that? They were like, yeah. how can I do that? You know, and, <laughs> and I was like, just try, just see what, you know, <laughs> knowing how to do those kinds of things, knowing how to tell a good story to get into the meat of the story right away. There's a, a virtue to that. I love the rules, prompts and the rules. Yeah, I'm with you there. Such good stuff when you get to make them follow the rules. <laughs> <laughs> make them follow your rules oh yeah yeah <laughs> not gonna lie that thrills me oh mr langan we've come to the end we did okay it. we made it the dark tower looms ahead absolutely the road goes over on we must follow the beam once more i realized i forgot to properly introduce you <laughs> at the beginning <laughs> just add something on at the beginning i'm totally gonna do that but for any listeners out there who aren't familiar with you and your work or what you're up to, all the fun stuff you are plugged into, what you've got going on, can you kind of give us a little boilerplate? Sure, sure. I, uh, I'm the author of two novels and five collections of stories. I uh, won the Bram Stoker Award once and the This Is Horror Award three times. I uh, I have stories appearing pretty regularly the most recently in uh, Ellen Datlow's uh, Christmas anthology Christmas and other horrors which is interesting not really a Christmas story it's more of a solstice story and I'll have other stuff coming out uh, imminently I uh, I live in in the Mid-Hudson Valley in New York where I've lived pretty much my entire life I am depressingly local <laughs> I um 
I'm one of the co-founders of the Shirley Jackson Awards. I was a juror in the award for the first three years, and now I'm on the board of advisors. I have, I, I guess I should say, I do not have too many books um, as they like fall over and crush me. And yeah, I think that's about it. I'm on all the usual social media platforms. I'm, I'm not very hard to find. I spend way too much time online and I'm trying to write. I've written the beginning of my third novel and my agent shopping it around now. And we'll see if anybody's interested. Oh my goodness. Are you able to share a brief synopsis or it's top secret right now? No, it's, it's at the end of my novel, the fisherman, there's an object that these workers who are clearing the ground for the Ashokan reservoir recover. It's this gem sort of thing that's tucked in the roots of a tree and, it is, they leave it in place. And then the next day when they get there, it's gone. <gasps> and that figures into this novel, but it's, uh, and it's where the novel gets its title from the cleaving stone. But the plot of the novel, it's about four people who are going up into the, the mountains, up into the Catskills because their beloved father slash professor who disappeared 10 years ago, searching for a kind of local sort of Sasquatch creature has reappeared and <gasps> communicated with them and said, please, I, I want to see you. Please come see me. And so they're going up to see him. And yeah, things go on from there. Things, <laughs> things happen. Shenanigans happen. Oh my God. My jaw is, is, is on the floor, John. That is so, wow. What a compelling premise. I'm in. I'm in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So excited. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for being an exceptional fellow educator and king reader. Well, thank you so much for, for doing this and for having me on it. It's, uh, you know, I often think that writers, like, if we don't keep talking about them, they just disappear. Yeah. You know, like, like it doesn't matter how many books are on the bookshelf at the at the moment or in the bookstore at the moment. Stop talking about somebody and gradually they just fade, you know, they fade from view. So I think it's important for us to I think it's important for us to talk about the writers that matter to us. And I also think it's important for us to talk about writing that matters to us, books that matter to us. So I'm I'm grateful to you for doing this. You're quite welcome, sir. Thank you. I'm, I have all the feels. No, very good. <laughs> All right, Mr. Langan, take care. And I would love to have you back in the future. Thank you. Some short story stuff. That sounds terrific. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye now. I thank you so much, Mr. Langan. What a prince, eh, fellas? I'm telling you, I so loved my time with John, and I can't wait to have him back because he is someone who adores the short story format as much as I do, so I need to talk more shop with John. It must happen. I think he had fun, so maybe he'll pop back over if I find the right king story to lure him. <laughs> For more information on where to follow John and the progress of his third novel, I've included some helpful links in the show notes, so please head there and make sure you're in the loop with author John Langan and get yourself some copies of The Fisherman and all of his other works so you'll be ready for The Cleaving Stone. Oh, so excited for that. He had me at Gem, to be honest. Gem. Did he have all of you? I'm sure of it. Oakley dokily, my loves. We're going to pull this curtain closed, but before we do, please make sure you are someone who has shared the show with a friend if you've been listening for a while, and that you've given us a rating, a review if you're feeling very generous, and that you've subscribed to us on YouTube. We are there now and awful lonely, so it would be great to have all of you support the brand new YouTube page. For our next episode, I'm pretty sure it's going to be Finders Keepers because I really, really like that installment in the Bill Hodges trilogy. It's such an outlier, really solid, and I have some thoughts, so that may happen. But I also might have, or definitely have, a fresh take on one of my all-time favorite King titles that I've recently reread to chat with Matt and Scott from Kingslingers. Oh, friends. I, I think if you all know me by now, you know I'm obsessed with this title. I mention it 
all the time. This was a third time read for me, and I'm so swoony for it. It's just absolutely everything. That's what it is. Gothic, beach, dark feminine, recovery, friendship, the hand of fate, art, beauty, loss. <sighs> so that one might be coming up soon. I will most definitely need to return to the sandy shores of Duma Key for just a little slice of time because I adore that novel so much and I have something to say in the four years since my last read through. So finders keepers, a Duma return. Not sure which is coming first, but those will be the next ones. And after that, I am double fingers crossed, hoping to start Wolves of the Kala. Hoping. No matter what, guys, it's going to happen. I'm reading Wolves of the Kala this year. That will happen. To quote Scarlett O'Hara, one of the most terrific heroines in all of literature, as God as my witness, I will read Wolves of the Kala this year. It will happen. I just got to figure out timing. But with all this talk of the dark half, I really wanted to bump that one up a little bit, but I think dark half might need to be my Halloween pick this year. But then Salem's Lot's going to get bumped yet again. Oh, guys, <laughs> there's too many titles and too little time. But no worries, we'll get it figured out. No fretting required. Keep an eye out for more announcements on my upcoming Patreon entitled The Dance Macabre with Kim C. That will be launching sometime next month with exclusive content only heard on the Patreon and nowhere else. There's going to be some grit definitely some charm, and hopefully it's not going to bore anyone, so stay tuned for more info as we creep into the month of April. The Dance Macabre with Kim C is coming. That's all I have for now, folks. I love you all so very much, and I hope wherever you are, it's not too cold. Spring Equinox has arrived, but I don't know if certain parts of the country or hemispheres have got the memo. Maybe not fully spring in some parts of the world, but regardless, the sunshine is on its way. Thank you all so very much for listening. I appreciate it so much. Take care, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.